a pleasure to be here. Thank you all for coming. Um, so let me start by giving you a little background information on the gentleman you see pictured here. His name is Frank Lenz. He's the subject of my book, The Lost Cyclist. This photo was taken in the fall of 1893, and it shows Frank in full battle gear. He's about, uh, he's in a studio in Calcutta, so he's been on the road for about 50 months at this point in his attempt to circle around the world on what was then kind of a newfangled creation, the safety bike, which is basically the modern prototype for the chain and sprocket. Um, I'm going to give you a little background uh, before we talk about his world tour, to give you some uh, background on Frank himself. He was born in Philadelphia in 1867 to a young German-born couple that had uh, just emigrated um, to the United States at the close of our Civil War. His dad, Adam, was a cigar maker, his mom, Anna, a homemaker. And we don't know what happened to Adam, um, because, uh, but it does appear that he died somehow when Frank was just a toddler. Um, fortunately, the death records in Philadelphia are sparse in that period, so I was unable to get um, any information on his death. Uh, what I do know is that when Frank was about five or six, Anna took him to Pittsburgh and the two settled there and that's where um, Frank grew up. Anna remarried another German-American named William Lenz who was um, a um, machinist at Westinghouse and at that point Frank Reinhardt as he was born became Frank Lenz after he was adopted by William, uh, a future cycling fame. Frank um, went to Catholic grammar schools. He graduated uh, from Central High in 1884, and then he took a two-year course to learn accounting and penmanship, because in those days you really you had to have good writing if you were going to do books. Um, Frank landed a pretty good job with a uh, brass manufactory. Uh, it paid him over $1,000 a year was a lot of money back then. So uh, since he was also living at home, he was able to splurge something, uh, spend something like a tenth of that sum, over $100 on a brand new bicycle in 1886 when he was 19. Um, now at that time, the bicycle was not what you see here, but it was the standard bicycle, also known as the ordinary, was the high wheeler. And you probably all, or you may know it as the penny farthing, I'm sure you've all seen pictures of it, if not the real thing, with the big front wheel and the tiny trailer. Uh, so that's the bicycle that um, Frank learned how to ride, and he would spend every spare moment on that wheel. Uh, he quickly got a reputation for his, for his daring long-distance long tours. Um, he loved to do centuries, as we do even today, um, except, you know, he had to ride around on non-existent roads and hilly um, Pennsylvania, Western PA. He, um, on one occasion, he left home at six in the morning to go to Newcastle, which is about 50 miles away. And on the way back, his handlebars broke, but he still got home before midnight, so it counted. And he'd have a little um, gas lantern suspended from his front hub so he could see his way. So he was not only not only did he get a reputation for his travels, but he was also very fast on his machine. So. His friends urged him to try racing, um, although he didn't have the classic build of a high wheel racer because of the construction of that machine with a direct drive on the front hub. It favored the long legged, and Frank was only five foot seven. Um, he was, however, pretty stout. He was um, about, uh, I think, 165 pounds and quite strong. So, in fact, when he entered these races, which would range from about a quarter of a mile to two miles, depending on how many laps they did. Um, he actually won quite a few of them, generally um, nipping his opponents at the finish line. So he started to get a pretty good reputation as a racer as well. And the highlight of his racing career occurred at the end of this, his second season, um, in the fall of 1888. That's when he entered an unprecedented um, road race of 100 miles, um, starting in Erie, Pennsylvania and ending in uh, Buffalo, and um, it was all organized in conjunction with an industrial fair there. So a number of things were supposed to happen. Um, 
One, uh, the winner was supposed to break the 100-mile um, record, which at the time stood at about seven hours, I believe. Um, and that's because um, it was routed along one of our best <coughs> highways at the time, the Erie uh, Shore Road. And the, the contestants, who were to number something like 25 from all across the country, they were going to wind up, they would arrive in Buffalo on the specially built track before something like 25,000 fans. Um, now this sport at the time was only 10 years old and it was certainly nothing like that had ever happened in American cycling. So um, that was very, uh, Frank was quite motivated to extend his regional reputation to national one. He trade very hard for this event. But unfortunately, the day of the race, uh, it was a torrential downpour and the whole course was flooded. And, you know, the high wheeler was dangerous enough under ideal conditions because of the propensity to kind of fling the rider mm -hmm. over the handlebars, something that was known as a header when your head hits something uh, after you flew off the bike. Uh, so, of course, in, under these conditions, it, uh, basically a very dangerous proposition to go ahead with the race, but the racers, including Frank, insisted on going ahead with it, uh, even though the field was down to about 16. Um, so they did, and miraculously the winner came in in just under 10 hours, which meant that he had averaged about um, 10 miles an hour over 10 hours riding a high wheeler through swamps. Um, that was uh, an impressive achievement. and. Since this was kind of a fringe sport at the time, I mean, it was obviously young men who were riding these things. Um, that was a bit of a revelation to the public that a bicycle could be so efficient. But uh, unfortunately, the winner was not Len, uh, was not Fr or Frank. Um, he led most of the race, but he was out fox down the stretch and came in a disappointing third. So I think that was kind of a turning point in his cycling career. Um, because it soured him on racing. And the next day, when he lingered at that fair in Buffalo, he came across a display of historic bicycles. And one of them was a high wheeler similar to his own that a gentleman named Thomas Stevens had just ridden around the world. Um, he had covered something almost 15,000 miles, um, covering over three continents in three years. And Frank, he knew all about that uh, feat because he'd read the reports in Audi magazine. But I think when he actually saw that bike, it really planted a seed in his head that, you know, that's that's the ideal job. That's what I really want to do. No more racing, no more bookkeeping. I want someone to hire me to go around the world on my bicycle. Um, unfortunately, there wasn't a huge demand at that point <laughs> for another globe girdler, um, as Stevens was known. But Frank was a patient sort, and he figured he would ultimately get his chance. And about a year after that race, he discovered his second love in life, which brought him a step closer to realizing that dream, and that was photography. Um, here you see a self-portrait that's Frank in um, three different moods, which was pretty tricky before Photoshop. He had to go a dark room and triple exposed. And, um, Frank realized that he knew that Stevens' uh, journey was illustrated by pen and ink drawings that an artist had imagined. So he figured if he were to propose to go around the world with wheel and camera, he'd have an edge because he would actually take photographs along the way. So that was kind of his pitch. And he started to take, build his portfolio. Um, so starting about 1890, he, start, he takes photographs of himself tooling around on his high wheeler. And here we see Frank on the far, your far right. He's with uh, two of his buddies. Uh, the one in the middle, Charles Pettigore with the bush, bushy mustache, is his best friend. Uh, they're in Glenshaw, Pennsylvania, just outside of Pittsburgh. Now, you know, cycling today is often about getting through the city, but in, at this time it's really about getting out of the city, especially grimy, dirty, industrial city, the smoky <clears throat> city of Pittsburgh. So this is what they love to do, was to get on their wheels and go out and enjoy nature. And of course, uh, they essentially have the roads to themselves, such as they are. There's no automobiles. Occasionally, there might be a horseman. But they were um, certainly the fastest things on the road at that time. Here's another view of Lenz um, pointing with a, the, one of the buddies we saw before. This is an Ohio pile, which is, those of you who know Pittsburgh, um, you know it's not very far. Uh, and it's where Frank Lloyd Wright 
built his masterpiece, Falling Water. And what was remarkable about this event was after viewing the falls, Lenz and his buddy got on their high wheelers and they um, zipped down the narrow dirt pass um, overlooking this raging river. And, you know, a high wheeler has no free wheel mechanism, so when the pedals start to spin furiously, the technique was to take your legs and drape them over the handlebars. So you can imagine it's not the best position uh, if you have to stop suddenly. Um, and when the locals saw these two careening down those paths inches away from death because they could very easily have just gone off um, down the cliff, um, they were aghast really. And it, it uh, Frank started to get a reputation for being something of a daredevil. This is another photo Lenz took, uh, Washington, PA, 30 miles south of Pittsburgh. I like to point out that there's three <coughs> symbols of modernity there. You've got your oil derrick, um, which at that time they're they're looking for kerosene um, for lighting, not gasoline for automobiles. Uh, you've got your telegraph pole in the center, and of course you've got the high wheeler it's, itself, which is a high tech article. <coughs> Weighs about 40 pounds, has um, steel tubing, uh, smooth ball bearings, a solid rubber tire. So for somebody like Lenz, it really wasn't that hard to do 100 miles in a day, even on these roads. In fact, that high wheel was pretty effective uh, in that it absorbed a lot of the road shock. Um, now, Frank is actually taking the photo, he's taking all these photos and himself. And what he would do is he'd, um, he'd dismount at some point when he found no. you know, a scene that he wanted to photograph. And he uh, would look through, his, uh, well, I should explain too that, of course, we're not talking about a, a uh, phone camera here. Um, what he's got is a kind of boxy wooden camera, um, a fairly, fairly large size. And he's using glass plates at this point because film's not on the market, so he's got to bring that and his got glass plates. So he finds, he sets up his camera on a tripod if he brought one, or on a ledge somewhere, he gets the background he wants through the finder. Then he had devised this cable, one end attached to the camera. The loose end had a rubber bulb at the end of it. He placed it on the road, and he knew when he rode over it, the camera would take the photo. So he knew exactly when to look right at the camera, and he's apparently told the little kid to do the same. Um, you know, and in this day and age, better known for kind of stiff studio shots, uh, that's pretty impressive to, to take an outdoor uh, a photo like that of, of something in motion. This is another scene of Lenz and his buddies outside of Pittsburgh, around 1890 still. Um, Frank is the fellow under the umbrella. That was another one of his ingenious inventions. It sat on his camera case and it shielded him from the rain and the sun. Uh, so in the uh, summer of 1890, that August, he had a month off. So, he, again, he's trying to build his portfolio as a cyclist and photographer. So, he decides he's going to go with his best friend, Petticord, from Pittsburgh to St. Louis along the National Road, now Route 40. And this is, in fact, this is New Concord, Ohio. They are literally on the National Road. So, you can see what a national highway, a super highway was back in 1890. You've got uh, Petticord and Lance sitting down, and it looks like they have a couple of friends and, of course, um, the inevitable gawkers. Here's another scene a little bit farther on. Uh, it's called Louisville, Indiana. Uh, this time, you'll see Lenz on the far left, uh, Petticord in the middle. They've run into a couple of safety riders. Um, so these are the, the um, new-style bicycles um, that have been developed in England. Um, in fact, uh, they really were just introduced a couple of years in the on the American market a couple of years before when Lenz made that race to Buffalo. There was only one safety of this sort in the mix. A fellow from Boston brought it and promptly dropped out. Um, and the typical reaction of longtime cyclists like Lenz and Petticord was literally to look down on these things. Uh, they didn't take them seriously. Uh, first of all, they felt that the high wheeler was the paragon of elegance and efficiency given its direct drive and they like being high up kind of on level with the horsemen also a little bit elevated from the dust of the road so they considered the position the lowly position on the safety um, 
rather um, distasteful. Uh, and also they distrusted it mechanically because they figured that chain and the sprocket would uh, waste a lot of, of their pedaling power. So um, they also thought it just looked clunky and heavy. So um, they didn't think much of it, but by this time, in fact, it had made significant inroads because a number of older riders were abandoning their high wheelers for this. Of course, it's called a safety because you don't fall as far. You don't have that head of infinite. I know someone would have asked that. Um, so, you know, you get older riders that are gravitating towards it. Uh, you also have a lot of newcomers like these two here, I'm sure, were not previously cyclists. And this is, in fact, the time when women start to cycle because they start to buy these hard tire safeties as well. So this, as they make their way to St. Louis, they see more and more safeties on the road, and it, it's kind of uh, emblematic of how the bicycle world is, is in, in a state of flux just then. Um, you see that even more so in this photo on the same trip. Um, the Terre Haute uh, Bicycle Club has come out to see Lens and Pedicord, and you'll notice there's yet a third bicycle in the mix. It's, uh, you see it over here. That's the American Star. Um, it effectively reversed the two wheels, so the small wheel is up front, and the big wheel is in back, and you sat over the big wheel. And to make that possible or more feasible, um, instead of using rotary pedals, uh, they introduced these independent treadle systems. Um, so that meant that uh, if you're sitting over the big wheel, uh, you're, you're not going to have a header. You might have a bummer if you fall this way <laughs> and land on a soft spot. But that was considered safer, so that too was a safety bike. And you know, for it's at this point, it's really unclear which of these three, you know, will the ordinary withstand these challenges? Will the safety emerge as the bicycle of the future, or will it in fact be the American Star? Nobody was quite certain. Here's another scene along that road to St. Louis. Uh, this time, you can get a good view of how they pack their bicycles. Lens has a little bundle strapped to the backbone, and they've got a pannier over the handlebars, and of course. Again, you have the gawkers, and, and you can see, once again, the quality of the roads. Now, they did get to St. Louis, and just in time, they were delayed because of rains, but uh, just in time for Frank to shoot this photo of the start of a high wheel race. Um, notice that uh, their gentlemen here are holding up the, the competitors, so they're waiting for the gun to sound before they give them a nice little push. So a year rolled by, um, summer of 91 came around, and Len still didn't have a sponsor, but he wasn't too discouraged. He figured he'd just take a more ambitious trip with Pedicord, and this time the two of them decided to go to New Orleans, which would be about a thousand miles, uh, which they tended to do in a month. And this is the scene of their, the day, the morning of their departure, um, Lens and Pedicord in the, in the foreground tipping their hats. They have three um, young escorts who are just going to go the first day. Two of them have the safety bike. This bridge still stands, by the way, in Pittsburgh. I cycled over it the other day. What's that? Lost a hat. Good thing on the right side. Oh. Oh, this, what? Ah, uh, no, the bridge. Oh, oh. <laughs> Oh, you're saying, you're saying that's not out there anymore. No. Okay, all right. You know Pittsburgh, yeah. I, I hadn't noticed that, but okay, I'll believe that. Um, so that's that's their departure. This is the second night out. Um, now, Lenz was a kind of a, a had a reputation of being kind of a prankster. Um, he, he was one of the um, probably, uh, well, definitely the most popular wheelman in all of Pittsburgh. Always had a smile. So this is. Um, probably one of his pranks here. He's, he's beaming as he, uh, taking that photo. Uh, Pedicord looks rather peeved. Uh, I think he's worried it's going on Facebook. <laughs> I guess, you know, they have what we'd call today a bromance, but that's as far as I'm going to go with that. Uh, they had to get over the Alleghenies, and he, even Lenz appears to be having second thoughts. Remember, there's no gears on these high wheelers either. And uh, so you can see that's a, that's a bit of a haul there. <coughs> but they do get to Cumberland, so they're going east on the same 
National Road as far as Cumberland, and at that point they go down the Shenandoah Valley toward New Orleans. This, uh, the two of them, are in um, in in uh, Lexington, Virginia. Uh, they're admiring a newly erected statue to General Stonewall Jackson. Um, of course, this was only about 25 years at the end of the Civil War, so tensions are still pretty pretty uh, high uh, between the North and the South. And as Yankee cyclists, they weren't all that well viewed in the South, and they created quite a scene when they arrived in Birmingham, Alabama on a Sunday morning, and they marched into the, the best hotel, the Florence Hotel, where all the uh, well-to-do locals were in their Sunday best having lunch and in walked what uh, one reporter called um, th these uh, dirt begrimed cyclists with their, uh, what he called it, their uh, skin-tight professional paraphernalia. Um, and he chided them for leaving their manners back in Pittsburgh. And But I think for these two, uh, you know, all they really cared about was getting a good meal. Uh, here they are a little farther on the way. Uh, this is Chattanooga's Lookout Mountain. Been there. Who's been there? Oh yeah, okay. And uh, you may notice a little cable there. That's how Lenz is taking a photograph uh, with Petticord puffing away on his bike. Now when they were off the bike, they obviously did dress up, so this was not the skin-tight <laughs> uniform that the journalist was referring to. Uh, that's it. That's the skin tight uniform. <laughs> this is Petticord. Stand. Uh, this reminds me kind of high, high noon. You've got, they stop in this little town in the northwest corner of Georgia called Trenton, and the whole town spells out to see them. So there's Petticord looking back as if he's about to draw his revolver. <laughs> Lenz has thrown his bike to the ground and just taken the whole photo. So I'm, I imagine they had to do a little explaining to get out of that town. Are they uh, camping at night? Uh, were they? Camp no, uh, I, they were generally trying to stay in hotels, but I, they may. I did. They did spend one or two nights on, outside. Not, not that they wanted to. Um, but at one point, Frank, uh, Frank's front wheel exploded, <coughs> so they realized that they couldn't. They weren't going to get to New Orleans on time unless they cheated, and that is, they'd have to take a train. So they crossed Mississippi by train. And this is a photo that Lenz shoots from the train as it's uh, approaching the drawbridge at Lake Pontchartrain just before um, New Orleans. And then when he gets there, he takes um, some cityscapes. So I think he's trying to show that he can do more than just photograph himself and his bike. That's a nice view of Canal Street. And here you see them before Old City Hall, which I discovered is still there in New Orleans. <laughs> Not bad photography either, if I meant to say. Um, here's another city scene of the old of port, the busy port. Ah, so when Lenz got back, he gets back uh, to Pittsburgh. This just, somebody emailed me this the other day, so that's why I put it in, because I think it's pretty amusing. Um, Lenz had, right after he got back from New Orleans, he he entered a race. He was the only high wheeler because at this point it's pretty much obsolete. And there's something like 15 safety riders with pneumatics. Uh, some of them at least had pneumatics. And, um, you know, Frank actually lost, so he kind of got the sense that his bike was doomed. But uh, this is a postcard that he's sending to recruit people for that race. Uh, please attend the Allegheny Cycler Run Friday, September 25th. I thought that was Frank G. Lance captain. He was captain of the Alleghenies. But it was just about that time that he received a letter from New York, which was the big break that he'd long been waiting for. That was from the editor of Audi magazine and uh, the new editor, the same magazine that had sent Stevens, James Warman. And he essentially agreed to Lance's proposition to go around the world with wheel and camera on the condition, however, that he'd have to leave the high wheeler behind and joined, you know, ride of safety like everyone else was at this point. I think that might have been a bit of a jolt for Frank, but he understood, he could see that the, the ordinary was in fact doomed. Uh, so he agreed to that. Um, and he promptly ordered his bicycle for the world tour, which was a 57 pound Victor made by the Overman Wheel Company in Chicopee Falls, Massachusetts. And he started to plot out his route. 
Uh, so of course he wanted to stop, top Stevens, so he's going to do 20,000 miles overland instead of, instead of just 15 that Stevens had done. He hopes to do it in two years rather than three, but he insists it's not a race. And he decides to reverse the direction, so he's going to go westward, first across the United States, then across Asia, and finally Europe. And in fact, he really does intend to cycle all the way across Asia, as nobody had done at that point. What he didn't know when he was planning this trip is that there were actually two other Americans who were already in the process of doing something very similar. <coughs> Thomas Allen over in the center and William Sokobin on the right. You're right. They were, in 1890, they were both seniors at Washington College, now University in St. Louis, and they were not cyclists But at that time. But the safety became all the rage on campus. They learned to ride. They decided what better to do the day after graduation than go off to England, purchase a pair there where they would be cheaper, and tool around the British Isles for a bit till they figured out what they wanted to do with themselves. And they did that, but they liked it so much, cycle touring, that they decided they would just keep going around the world. Um, unfortunately, they, unlike Lenz, who had to desperately search for a sponsor, they already had fairly wealthy parents who could fund this scheme. So uh, here they are. In, uh, uh, this is the fall of 1892 as they're approaching Peking. Um, so it's about um, six months after Lenz has left on his journey. Um, they weren't known to Americans just yet because of the fact that they were self-sponsored and started in England. But about a month after this photo was taken when they arrived on the West Coast here, they, were, um, they became celebrities when the, the press started to hear about these remarkable travelers. They compared them to Marco Polo, etc. Uh, now, curiously, Lenz had already left the United States at that point. In fact, they almost intersected because Lenz was on his way to China. These two heard about the, uh, that another round the world cyclist was supposed to come through uh, Shanghai, so they dallied a bit hoping to meet him, but he was delayed. Um, so they missed each other by about 10 days. But the stories still come together because when Lenz disappears, two years later into his trip in eastern um, Turkey. This is the man who goes off uh, to try to find him. Uh, one of the bolder decisions that Lance made preparing for the trip was to go with pneumatic tires, which had just been introduced. So of course there was really no, or couldn't be sure how well they would hold up, nor you know where you were going to find spare inner tubes, but uh, Frank was uh, determined to use them because he saw their he had great advantage in them. So he came up with a plan. He got himself a trunk. He filled it up with spare inner tubes and other parts that he might need, and he shipped it a little bit ahead of himself. It also wound up being a fairly useful repository because when he got knickknacks along the way, um, he could dump them in the trunk. This is a photo of the trunk and all its contents as it was recovered uh, in Constantinople by Soklobed. Uh, that was the last place Lenz had shipped it to, and unfortunately he didn't get there himself to reclaim it, so um, it, it fell to Sokobin to bring it home to his mom in Pittsburgh, to Lenz's mom. Um, but it's sort of interesting to look at some of the things that are in it, the sandals, the goggles, the passport papers. Um, these things, that's what he put over his rear wheel, the words his bicycle world, and he had a bunch of them made because they're in different languages, so that when he got to a new country, he would put up the one corresponding to that country that, so that it explained in the local language who he was. I think he was trying to hope, he was hoping to diffuse some hostility. I'm not sure how effective it was, since probably most of the people who ran into didn't know how to read, but um, it was still kind of a brilliant idea. Um, that's Frank being uh, hoisted and feted at by his uh, friends in Pittsburgh. That's Petticor right behind him. And now, of course, Petticor should have gone on this Round the World tour, but he backed out at the last minute. Uh, so that's the Allegheny Cyclers fetting their former captain as he's about to leave around the world. Um, this is the house that Frank left. It turns out it's still there in Pittsburgh, rem uh, remarkably enough. As you can see, they seem to be a fairly modest family. Uh, that's uh, Webster Ave. It's, it's the Hill District. Um, here's Frank and um, Medicord again. This is a day of his unofficial departure from the central post office in Pittsburgh. Um, he goes to Washington, gets his passport and a letter of introduction from the Secretary of State himself. 
gets to New York City for the grand send off, leaves from City Hall, surrounded by hundreds of wheelmen, um, and bands are playing, people leaning from windows, waving handkerchiefs. Uh, so it's quite a scene as he makes his way up. Then things settle down, reaches Albany, and he starts his way across the U.S. Here he is in Buffalo. He would, uh, of course, he had friends with him everywhere he went. He was greeted by the local wheelmen and wheel women. Um, he goes into Canada for a little bit, um, and he emerges uh, back in the States in, at Detroit, goes on to Chicago, sees the white city under construction, and wishes he could hang around to see the exhibit, but he can't, has to keep going. Um, he <coughs> goes through Milwaukee, Madison, then he reaches uh, Minneapolis, and that's up until that point he had a, an escort with him, a guy named Robert Bruce who worked for Audi. He would go ahead of Lenz by train and alert the local wheelmen and the press to, to help drum up interest in this journey. But he decided uh, to drop out after Minneapolis, leaving Lenz alone across the Great West, um, where, you know, under not ideal conditions, because it's summer, so it's like 100, 100 degrees at some days. Here he is, um, somewhere uh, in this little town in North Dakota, apparently asking for directions. <laughs> Here he is leaving a lumber camp because he couldn't always find hotels somewhere in the west. And, and there he is watching a train go by. Now from Minneapolis on he follows the Northern Pacific lines. In fact he often rode between them, between the rails, because that was a better surface than the roads. And the only real problem with that is that occasionally he'd be on a railroad bridge and suddenly a train would come out of nowhere. So his technique was to grab his wheel, his bicycle by the front wheel with one hand and with the other hand, he'd suspend himself and the wheel off the ledge of the bridge while the train rumbled overhead. And then all he had to do was kind of fling his bike back up and hoist himself. Robert Bruce actually saw a performance like that in Wisconsin and figured, you know, poor Lenz is never going to make it around the world. He's way too, um, way too uh, reckless for that. Um, he does, however, get to Yellowstone. Uh, he has to, he runs, actually, the, he sleeps under a rock while there's a snowstorm going on, almost drowns crossing the river, but he gets to Old Faithful. And here he is just after he's crossed the Rockies in Missoula, Montana. It's one of the few he didn't take himself, uh, but it's a nice view of his camera case. And notice the little chamois he stitched onto his pants for extra comfort. So the whole thing weighed, I told you the bike was 57 pounds, but the gear and everything, was 110 pounds. So, and no, well, there are two gears. Um, so his rear wheel here has two different sprockets, one bigger than the other. So if he, w he wants to stop and flip his rear wheel around, he can get a lower gear. But it's <laughs> not exactly, you know, click shift. It's shifting. Here he is um, in the woods of Idaho looking contemplative. And this was one of the toughest stretches going uh, along the Columbia River Gorge, he runs into a dust storm, so he has to walk about 120 miles. Uh, it took him about a week, and obviously there's not a lot of food and water around there. Um, he did have five flats, uh, but he was satisfied that uh, he, he had made the right choice of tire. <coughs> Here he is in Washington State admiring the peak. And uh, approaching California, he's in California. Even Frank is not going to try to cycle up that no, with, with that gear. So he gets to San Francisco, huge send off, uh, but he knows that that was the easy part. Uh, the real adventures lie ahead abroad. So there he is on board the Oceanic. Um, he actually did have, there was a little incident in San Francisco where he was out with some wheelmen and um, they had a little too much to drink. And Frank was actually arrested on this last night and thrown in jail had to face the judge in the morning, but fortunately, um, although Frank uh, denied that he was drunk, the, and the, the judge had showed some leniency, however, because Frank had to catch this boat. Um, this is a letter he wrote on board to his, uh, the brother of his stepfather, because he detested his stepfather, he didn't write him directly, but he was okay with writing the brother of the, of the stepfather. Notice the lovely handwriting. Mm -hmm. and, um, What's interesting, a couple of things is he talks about how he's going to get through China in two months. It would actually take him about six. And this paragraph is kind of moving. He writes, if you see my mother, 
always try to drive the fear from her, as I will no doubt get through everywhere without trouble. Regards to all, Frank. Of course, his mom had begged him not to go. She had a premonition that he would never get back alive. Um, Frank pleaded that this was his one chance to see the world. He did promise he would write her every week. And in fact, at one point in the middle of China, he writes t to tell her that he's as far away from home as he'll ever get, so he's now on his way home, <laughs> trying to, I guess, um, reassure her. Here he is stopping in front of the Royal Palace in Honolulu. He had one day there. And he gets to Japan. Um, he winds up spending about a month there, covers about a thousand miles. There's a little bit of culture shock in his first country abroad. Uh, at the end, he, he's quite surprised to find co-ed bathing going on, uh, but he adjusts to that pretty well. <laughs> and he, uh, he's okay with the diet, too, even if there is a lot, was a lot of fish for him. Um, and the Japanese people he found very friendly. Um, he was overall quite happy there and found that there was wonders, many wonders to behold and natural and man-made. Here he is in front of a giant Buddha. He's down there with a few other tourists. Uh, this is an example. At this point he's using film and it's an example of a photo he sent back to outing and they've reproduced it in one of their articles. Um, here he is in, on a highway in Japan, drawing a lot of looks. And uh, there were, of course, a couple of mountains he had to do, and, uh, and, he, and this was before the mountain bike, and he's not going to be able to, you know, bike or even walk the thing over. So he hires what he calls coolies. Those are young uh, laborers. So there's Lens leading the way. Uh, here's his help and they would uh, strap the bike onto this pole and just walk over the mountains. So when he got to China in the end, uh, late 92, he had to figure out how to get across it. The other two that I mentioned, they had gone, taken the northern route through the Gobi Desert, uh, which in some ways was easier than trying to cut through the heart of China. Uh, Lenz consulted missionaries and diplomats and the uh, telegraph company officials and they all tried to dissuade him. They told him that there had been waves of anti-foreigner riots, a number of missionaries killed, uh, that it would be foolhardy, even suicidal, to attempt this, especially with winter coming on. But of course, Frank doesn't listen to that. Um, finally, the telegraph company officials come up with a plan. They say, just follow our poles all the way to Burma. So that's about 3,000 miles. Um, at least he can't get lost that way. And, there's, there's stations along the way where he can stay and where the operators will give him a con. So that's in fact what he does. But of course he finds that he's a magnet for unwanted attention. Here he is sitting down to a meal. I think he's trying to use chopsticks to blend in. But uh, if you look at the faces around him, it's obvious that he's not getting away with that. Uh, here he is on the roadside. This seem, seems like they're having a, a friendly conversation. Lens over here. and the, locals there, though I'm not quite sure how they're communicating. There was, however, one incident where Lenz um, really almost, it was a near-death experience, and for reasons he never understood, he was surrounded, he found himself surrounded by about 30 irate peasants with wielding pitchforks, and uh, he really did think that was the end, but then he had an idea. He jumped on his bike and he started doing tricks, uh, like riding, you know, while standing on the saddle. <laughs> And he got a few laughs, like this gentleman here, and then it all spread throughout the crowd. So he was able to make a very polite um, getaway after that. So he was a, 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 a guy who thought on his feet. Here's, here he is again in China. Now the people in the background there, they don't know they're being photographed, because uh, Lenz knew that there was superstition against photography. So he didn't let on that he was taking their photo. Here he is approaching a very narrow bridge. <laughs> I can only assume that's the toll collector. And I hope Frank is reasonably sober if he's going to get across this by biking. Maybe, maybe. <laughs> he still needs to be pretty sober. <laughs> um, here he is on an, a, a more traditional type bridge, a nice stone bridge uh, with a pagoda in the background. Uh, checking his iPod, I guess. No, I'm not quite sure what he's doing in that photo. 
but you, you'll notice it's raining because everybody has umbrellas. Uh, this shot, you can really see that it's winter. Frank's squatting down here. It's cool. He's over there on the bike and the pole down there. Um, of course, at this point, he's really walking more than he is riding. So, of course, he's also falling way behind his schedule. Um, in fact, after he's even delayed for a month with some mysterious illness, he has to spend that a month in the um, in a telegraph station. Um, when he finally gets to Burma, where he is here, um, it's uh, summer, so it's monsoon season. All the roads are flooded. He realizes he can't bike all the way across Asia as he had hoped, so he has to go to Rangoon and catch a steamer to Calcutta. When he gets to India, he's very well received by the British colonialists. They even have their own bicycle club at this point. And Frank's feeling pretty good about things now because weather's good. He can cycle finally. Uh, he's got a very good road ahead of him. The British built a uh, Grand Trunk Road. Um, plenty of things to see. Um, the Indians are pretty uh, friendly to him. Uh, so he's feeling better um, about his situation. Uh, here he is a little bit uh, down the road on, um, admiring a fortress in Agra. And there he is in front of the Taj Mahal. Now that's a little cork helmet. That was kind of traditional, like a British, uh, British uh, colonialist. It's actually lighter, I guess, than it looks. And here's Frank again, chatting with, I believe, a British journalist at a Hindu festival. And here he is in front of a milestone. And this is part is where he has to cross what's now Pakistan. Uh, so he's got a, a little desert stretch to do, and he has to hire a guide with camels. But um, he does get through it. And this, finally he gets to Persia, um, gets to a, a port, a southern port, and uh, basically just has to go about 1,000 miles north um, until he reaches the border of Turkey. Um, this is Frank in uh, Tehran posing. This is in Farsi here. And finally, he gets to the northwest corner of Persia, now um, Iran, a uh, city called Tabriz. And he's at the, uh, he's invited to the uh, royal palace where the crown prince resides, the future Shah, who happens to be a photographer. So the, sh the crown prince himself takes this photo of Frank in his courtyard. Um, and sadly, it, it's the last photo ever taken of Frank. Um, it was later determined that a few days later, uh, he did indeed cross the Turkish border. Um, so he's at a point where really all he has to do is cycle about a thousand miles to Constantinople, and then he's at the gateway of Europe. And he knew that you know that would be quite easy from then on. But um, in fact, a lot of missionaries are advising him not to take that road because um, for a number of reasons, one thing, it's notorious, the caravan roads notoriously dangerous. They're the nomadic Kurds who are known to be kind of a tough lot, at least with, with foreigners. Um, plus, there were reports of increasing Armenian unrest. Uh, so a number of people advised Frank to go um, through Russia a more roundabout way. But Frank was very eager to, to get home, really. I mean, he, he couldn't wait to, he was, in Germany, he was going to see relatives that he, uh, that he had never met. Um, and he knew when he got to England, the birthplace and the safety would be um, treated royally. And of course, once he got back home in Pittsburgh, he'd be a superstar because it, uh, he knew that a great bicycle boom had broken out in its absence. So of course, he'd be seen as a pioneer. So for all those reasons, he was quite anxious to get home. Um, so I, uh, I'm going to, well, the last third of the book, I'm not going to go into detail on that because we're short on time. but. Um, you know, that really deals with the question of what happened to Frank and the investigation that Sockleman conducts. Um, so I won't go into that. What I, I think I will close, uh, could I just borrow a book? Do we have one here? <laughs> I just want to read the last. Um, I'm going to close by reading, um, thank you, um, what Frank's last communications from um, Tabriz. Just before he left Tabriz, for any, oh, and before I read this, let me just tell you that this 
envelope here is the letter contains a letter, Frank's last letter to his buddy Charles Petticord back in Pittsburgh. Um, so it was sent from Tabriz in late April 1894. Just before he left Tabriz, Frank dashed off a pensive letter to Charlie. It has been a long while since I've tasted pie and ice cream. Nothing but sour cream and black bread most of the time now. But I'm only 900 miles from Constantinople. And to his old clubmates he wrote, Maybe you fellows think that I am tired of this kind of life. Well, I am not. I enjoy it hugely. He conceded, however, that it has been rather rough for a year or over. To Warman he was even more forthcoming. I must confess to a feeling of homesickness. I am tired, very tired, of being a stranger. I long for the day which will see me again on my native hearthstone and my wanderings at an end. Well, of course, unfortunately, that day did come, but prematurely for Frank, he never did make it back home to Pittsburgh. So, obviously, there are tragic elements in the story, but I also think there's some uplifting things as well. Um, so with that, I'd be happy to take any questions. Yep? Um, where were the photographs developed? Were they sent with letters? Or how did yeah. the photographs get to publication? Right. Um, I think, well, I believe when he traveled across the U.S., he would stop and get films developed. He may even have been in the dark room himself, because he did do that right. sort of thing. My impression is that when he was abroad, he was sending the film to be developed. Whether he sent it directly to Outing or to his friend Petticord or somewhere else, I don't really know. But I, 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 he did send monthly packets with his reports um, to Outing. I imagine he could have had the film in there as well. But I'm really not 100% sure how he got them back. Uh, yes? Where did you find the letters, for oh. example, this last one? Okay. This comes from um, a scrapbook. This is actually Petticord's own scrapbook. Um, so it, a lot of these photos I've shown you of the world tour, I mean, some of them were published in outing, but it was still kind of expensive uh, at that time to publish photos. So relatively few of Lenz's photos were actually published in outing. But um, this scrapbook, which has about 80 pages, contains quite a few photos of the world tour, uh, mostly unpublished. And I found that by tracking down the gentleman who owns it. Actually, he found me, fortunately. Um, so it's pretty much the powers of the internet is how I got <coughs> with that. And the other earlier photos I showed you on his high wheel of the ones, those were glass plate photos. Um, there's a gentleman named John Lenz who descends from the Lenz family and, and he had those and was kind enough to make them available. And then I found a few other, like the cover photo turned up in Los Angeles um, at, because Sokhobin left some, it turns out, some things to the Natural History Museum. So that photo turned up and some other materials. So it, it took a lot of hunting to gather all this. <laughs> uh, yeah? What uh, He died, I think it was 19... Uh, 46. He never did marry. Uh, no kids. Uh, he was, he, I think he was, a, well, okay, what, and immediately what happened to him was he too bought a safety bike, a Victor, when Frank left, and he started to go kind of nuts, basically. I mean, the two of them had, Frank and Petticord, I think, did about a couple thousand miles a year on their high wheelers, and uh, Petticord started to do something like 10,000 miles a year on a safety. And he would do like 24-hour uh, rides, you know, 300-something miles. And, and then at a certain point, um, something went wrong with his leg, and I, he, nobody at that time really knew what. So he actually, when news broke that Lenz was missing, he was hobbled, and he really wanted to go over there to help find Frank, but he was uh, physically unable. Um, so I think that was the end of his cycling career. Um, I did talk to, uh, he had a, uh, he was close to a nephew, and, a, and his, the ne that nephew's son is now in his 80s, and he remembers Uncle Charlie showing up in this long uh, automobile uh, sometime in the 30s, I guess, and 
So I think it was a clerk for most of his life. Um, eventually retired to Florida. So that's about all I really know about him. Yep. Did uh, Frank gain any notoriety during the time he was traveling in the United States? Did he have a following? Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, absolutely, yeah. No, I mean, he, you know, he was reasonably well known before, um, at least among wheelmen, he was known as uh, before the world trip as the fellow who had taken all these photos on his high wheel tours. Uh, but then he becomes really a, a public uh, national celebrity when he embarks on his tour, world tour. And then when he disappears, he really becomes an international celebrity. Um, one of the things I, at one point I hired a researcher, I actually had the chance to go to Istanbul myself, but of course I can't read Ottoman Turkish, so I hired an investigator who found an interesting transcript. Um, it was a meeting of our minister, uh, basically our ambassador at the time, and the Sultan himself to discuss um, the Lenz case, and Terrell, his name was, our minister, he, he warns the Sultan, he says, uh, there's 60 million Americans carefully watching this case, so you better, you know, you better try to find this guy. That's basically what he told the Sultan, but apparently it didn't produce much of effect. But yeah, no, he was definitely, it was a very uh, big deal, and also because when Lenz disappears, when it's clear that Lenz disappears, when, the, when it sinks into the American public that Lenz is gone, that's exactly the same time they're getting reports of Armenian massacres. So there's some sense that this is an east-west kind of thing. Yep, way back. How often were his articles being published in the outing, and that's number one. Number two, obviously that was his journal on this trip, but was he keeping an, an additional Journal of what was going on yeah. Um, well, his, his outing was a monthly, and they, it, there was some lag time before that when they started to appear. Uh, but it was based when they did start, there would be an article on Lens every month. Of course, at one point, when they're talking about him being in India, they're also on the side talking about him being missing. Uh, now, as far as um, his reports go, he definitely um, would. Well, unfortunately, we don't have his handwritten reports, those have not turned up. Um, so it's hard to know exactly how much editing was done by outing. I know that Frank was extremely detailed because he talks about it in some of his articles. So he, he kept a journal noting every little detail about where he had slept, who he met, all sorts of things like that. But unfortunately we don't have the, but the outing articles are pretty detailed. So it's pretty, and, and I supplemented that with also a lot of newspaper articles. So sometimes I got some uh, supplementary information through interviews that he happened to give on the road. And one, there's one really nice uh, interview he gives in China uh, when he bumps into this British journalist and just after he, that near fatal incident. And he actually articulates, uh, talks about you know how, how this trip is going to prove that there's a good feeling among men of all nations. So he really elevated, um, I think he was maturing as he was writing. <laughs> you know, so it's no longer just about testing tires here. It like becomes kind of a world peace sort of thing. Um, yeah? Uh, he didn't look like he was carrying that much. What was he carrying? Um, it's, it's a lot. I mean, it weighs a lot. I know it doesn't may not look like a lot. Yeah. Well, apart from his camera in the, in the backpack, um, he had like a change of clothing. Had some tools. Um, what else did he have? Uh, well, you know, he had his tripod, his umbrella. Um, uh, let's see, what else? well, water, he had to carry water. Um, oil, I think he had some oil with him. So it all added up. No bedroll or anything, though? I, you know, I don't think he did bring a bedroll because most of the time he slept in inns. Um, you, you stop me if you ever want, um, if I'm going on too far. <laughs> yeah, we have time for maybe one more question. Okay, we'll take one more. Yes, gentlemen. Uh, there couldn't have been too many ATMs. Uh, what did you do? <laughs> Your question, how did he? How did he fund himself? As okay, well, um, he did leave a list. Um, he would always inform outing where he would be, even though he didn't always keep the schedule, but he would always go to where he said he'd go. Like, he'd give a hotel in Calcutta. He just didn't happen to get there, you know, when he said he would.
so there were points where he could be contacted. And so outing for could could cable him and say, you know, we've just sent two hundred dollars to such and such a bank. You can get stop there and pick it up. So that's in fact that one of the tip offs that things had gone wrong was when he didn't. Uh, he was supposed to go to a bank in Erzurum, in Turkey, and and collect one of one of these. Uh, checks that have been sent and he never made it there so now spending was also kind of a problem like in some places like China there, there were no there wasn't paper money so he had to carry quite a uh, quite a bit of um, coins to pay his coolies and whatnot um, so yeah it was uh, not easy to get around with the, the money situation was certainly nothing like it would be today all right Susan do you want me to well, thank you, dear. Okay, thank you.